designers. So psyched you decided to show up even though this is just about as late in GDC as you can get. I am honored by your presence and attention. Thank you. Welcome to Stop Shouting, Collaboration Through Candid Conversation. You all know how challenging it is to lead in video game development. You're leading multidisciplinary teams of people that maybe enjoy games more than they enjoy other people occasionally. It's not an easy role that you have. Uh, for those who were not at my talk the other day, long story short, I have been a producer and leader in game development and made many games, so I like to think I know what I'm talking about when I say video, leading video game development is hard. Problem we're here to focus on this hour is that difficult conversations make it harder. Quick definition of difficult conversations, people disagree and emotions run high. I'm gonna talk throughout this workshop as if it's two people disagreeing for simplicity, but of course it may be a group involved. Non-rhetorical question, I'm hoping you will shout out answers loud enough for my drumming and trumpet damaged ears to hear. Why do you care if you're good at difficult conversations? You want to make them easier, yes. And? You want to make decisions, absolutely. And? They're usually really important, yes. That is fundamentally why I started paying more attention to this. These are the moments where you fire the person or you don't. You hire the person or you don't. You get the publishing deal or you don't. The feature you love gets in the game or it doesn't. Often these difficult moments are the most important moments of our careers, if not our lives. So that's why I, like you, want to be better at these. Fortunately, data and experience tell us why and how we can do a better job of collaborating. As always, I'm trying to give you as little of my opinion as possible. I typically try to ground what I'm presenting in as much science as possible. Some of these are quite scientific sources, a couple of journals on the bottom, Crucial Conversations and Emotional Intelligence, based on good science. But I want to be completely candid with you all. There are also books here that are not as science-based. Creativity Inc., upper right, for example, is Ed Catmull's book. For those who don't know, he runs Pixar and Disney Animation and knows something about helping creative technical teams produce greatness. Candor is a central theme of his book, and that's why it's included among my sources. What does all that data and experience tell us? that it is possible to more intelligently conduct candid conversations in order to reach collaboration through those difficult conversations. A lot to do if you want to achieve that, so breaking down into three sections for today. First, examine your beliefs, and if you don't already value conflict, see if you can take the next step in understanding the value in conflict and maybe embracing it a bit more. That should set you up to better collaborate through that conflict. If you're gonna collaborate, you need to be thinking win-win. You need to bring all of your cooperation and then all of your assertion to reach collaboration. That is roughly one gazillion times easier said than done, which is why the third and final section is boost emotional intelligence to boost success. EI here is emotional intelligence. We're gonna walk through each of those sections. I will ask you to participate with me and various things that science say will help you learn and remember and act on this long term. I do have a handout for you. Here's how you can get it. If you have a US-based US phone, you can text happy brain with no spaces to 444999. I want to be crystal clear because I hate disappointing people. This will add you to my happy brain science mailing list. We send out roughly monthly tips on applying the science of happiness to work. It is one click to unsubscribe. If you don't have a US-based phone, this texting system probably won't work for you, in which case you can email me. I am scott at happybrainscience.com. Or if you want the handout but you don't want to get on my mailing list, email me and say, don't add me to your list, you spamming jerk. Just give me the handout. I will show you this information again at the end of the talk if you're not sure whether or not you want the handout yet. Lots more detail in the handout than we'll have time to go over today. So intelligently conducting candid conversations in order to collaborate begins by examining your beliefs and perhaps taking the next step in learning to value conflict. 
So here is where I would like you to talk to each other, ideally in pairs, but I don't want anybody to be left out, so let's not leave anyone out unless they want to be left out. So groups of three are just fine, but ideally pairs. For the next two minutes, you are talking about two questions. First one is, how do you personally feel about conflict? When someone says, Greg, I need to talk to you later in my office, do you go, woohoo, or, oh God. How do you personally relate to conflict? And then the second question I want you to discuss is how does your studio relate to conflict or whatever organization you're with? What's the culture of conflict in your organization? Please pair and share, discuss for the next two minutes those two questions. That's my way of letting you all know it's time to stop talking, please, and come back to one co group conversation. Thanks so much for our for choosing to participate. Regardless how you feel about conflict, science says it is coming your way. This is the Tuckman model of team building, first published in an academic journal in the 60s and has had a number of supporting studies published since then. This is a model, I learned a quote recently, I think it's by George Box, the quote is, all models are flawed, some models are useful. Love that quote. What it means is anytime you're dealing with a model, you're dealing with an imperfect representation of reality. Does team dynamics always work this way? No, of course not. But it's a useful model. It helps us understand some of what's happening to us in game development teams. This science has stood the test of time. Everybody starting at Intel, at least when I started there, oh, 10 years ago or so, were all trained in the Tuckman model because it's so useful. Tuckman model says, when you get together a game development team in the first place, you are forming. Forming means you are very polite to each other, it is very pleasant, and it is not very real, nor is it very productive. If someone irks you or says something you think is stupid in a meeting, you're likely to go, that thing that guy said was stupid, wasn't it? So that's, that's forming, that's polite, but not terribly real. Once you get to know each other a little more, you start storming. This is the conflict stage of team building. That's not your job, that's my job. Hey, you don't tell me what to do. Yes, I do. We don't do it that way around here. Well, you should do it that way around here. Conflict comes in storming. It's not bad, it's inevitable. If you want to move through it, you cannot skip over it according to this model. And all of my game development and other team experiences have confirmed this model for me. It is impossible to go from forming to norming. You have to go through storming to get to norming. In norming, you're starting to know what to expect from each other. Oh yeah, that's your, your job to do that part of the code base, not mine. Oh yeah, that's how Kevin works. You know, Stephanie, you need to ask her ahead of time because she likes lots of warnings. You're getting used to each other. You're working better together, but you're still not a well-oiled machine. There's effort in working better together. If you stay together long enough without a reorg, by the way, anytime a new team member comes or some significant change comes, you go back to forming and it's called reforming, and then you can more quickly move through these stages. But it's only when you th move through all these stages you get to the promised land, performing. If you've ever been on a team where everything is clicking, everybody knows who's gonna do what and how, and the baton passes smoothly without a lot of effort, it is a dream come true, especially in game development. You only get there by working through the conflict. If you're willing, I would like to ask you to stand up to show me which stage you think you and your colleagues are at now. Uh, those who saw my talk the other day, forgive the repetition. Why am I asking you to stand up and not just raise your hands? Because science suggests when your body's active, your brain produces more of what scientists call BDNF, brain-derived neurotropic factor, which long scientific story short you can think of as learning aid. So what you do is up to you. You can raise your hand or nod your head or whatever you want. But if you're willing, please, on your feet, if you are currently forming in your game development. Thank you, a few of you. Thank you. If you are currently storming on your feet, please. 
I would expect a high number of people given the topic of this session. Thank you, you can sit down. Uh, who has reached norming? The storming is starting to die down. You're doing pretty well. Good, good on you, well done. Thank you, you can sit down. And I'm guessing the few, the proud, the performing teams. All of you, yes, good job, people. Awesome, thank you, you can sit down. If you stood up during forming or storming, go talk to those performing people and ask them how they got there. What the science suggests is you get there by working through conflict, not skipping it, not placating it, but working through it, which is what this session is about. So when that inevitable conflict comes, you will react. I want you to imagine for a minute that you are not at your best. Somebody didn't tell you in a very skillful, polite way that your design sucked, let's say. They told you in a really rude way that triggered you. If you're not at your best, you tend to bring one of these styles. These styles very roughly correspond with the fight or flight response. Fight or flight response is our built-in, innate, fast, much faster than our logical brains. Our limbic system and brain stem respond with fight or flight. It's not a switch, it's a continuum. You can be a little stressed out or full-on panicked. And when you're towards fight or flight, your brain figuratively shrinks so that your limbic system and brain stem, the parts of your brain that look very much like the brains of all other mammals, come to the front burner and they say, hey, I've got the answers. The answers are fight, run, or although you hear about it less because it doesn't rhyme, your third option is just freeze, because if you shut up and stay still, the mountain lion might not see you and you might get away that way. Awesome for dealing with mountain lions and not so helpful for dealing with each other and problems in game development. So very roughly, those correspond to fighting. Some people get very aggressive. Oh yeah, well I'll tell you what to do with your stupid feedback, right? And some people get super cooperative, essentially uh, running. I'll give you whatever you want. Hey dude, whatever, that's fine. We can do it your way. And some of us just want to avoid a contact, uh, conflict altogether. These are very natural human responses. Conflict only v until very recent, well, still to present day really, if I think about it in a depressing way, conflict can be dangerous or deadly for human beings. So you're wired to survive, and so a natural, this fight or flight response is a natural way to stay alive and avoid conflict, because you tend not to win conflicts with mountain lions. But in the studio, you're not dealing with mountain lions, but your brain is wired to deal with mountain lions. If you're willing, I know I'm putting these nasty labels and you would never describe yourself as aggressive or acquiescing, but if you're willing to map yourself to one of these three, let's do a quick uh, second round of standing up. If you want to fight when conflict comes on your feet, please. The aggressors. Again, you're not at your best. You're being pushed into this. Thank you, fighters. You can sit down. I said sit down, fighter. Sorry, bad joke. Uh, if you acquiesce, hey, dude, whatever you want, that's fine. I'll adjust the schedule. I'll do the feature your way on your feet, please. All the fighters are like, ooh, can I hire that guy? Thank you, you can sit down. And if you're just like, I'm running, I'm avoiding, I'm not talking to you, I gotta go home. If, you're, if you just tend to avoid conflict, please, on your feet, and see how we have different styles, and part of your job as a leader is to understand your own natural style, your teammates' natural style, and how to work with it. There are better versions of these responses, right? Aggression can just be asserting. How do you get calmer and more logical so you can bring a more constructive response? You learn to value conflict as not being so threatening. I hope you'll all forgive me for doing what I virtually never do, putting a ton of text on screen. I think it's terrible in presentations, but I wanted to be sure to get this quote right because it's from a person who's way smarter than I am who published this article, The Conflict Positive Organization. It depends on us in the Journal of Organizational Behavior. Dean says, as you can see, by developing cooperative relationships and the skills to discuss diverse views open-mindedly, Organizations can empower managers and employees to use conflict to probe problems, create innovative solutions, learn from their experience, and enliven their relationships. 
It does indeed depend on us. And if we can embrace conflict a bit more as a useful tool, we might respond a bit better to it and not be so fight or flighty about conflict. Conflict makes the unseen visible. Your job as a leader in game development is to find and fix problems and make things better, right? That is impossible if you don't know a problem exists. When conflict arises, you know there's a problem there. Anyone had conflict bring an issue to their attention that they did not know was there before the conflict? See all the hands. So this is one of the many values in conflict as it makes the unseen visible. I apologize, I don't have much time for stories today, but Ed Catmill's book is filled with great stories, Creativity Inc. If you want inspiration and stories around some of these key points I'm making here on valuing conflict. Conflict can also solve those problems that they raise and bring balance, right? You might have a pair of people that's way out of balance. John, John feels fantastic, he thinks the project's going great, and Julie thinks, why is John such a all and making my life miserable all the time at work, conflict can actually make that a little more balanced for people. Conflict is part of the creative process. It's how you make great games. Given the short amount of time we have, I will leave it there. Now, beliefs don't change with a snap of a fingers, right? But maybe, just maybe, your brain has heard something that has made sense to you, and beliefs are starting to shift for you. So I invite and encourage you to take a minute or so in silence and think, what have you heard so far? What's relevant for you? And what, if anything, is starting to shift in your beliefs around conflict? Please think or write for a minute of silence. Wrap up, please. We have time for maybe one quick question, ideally at one of these mics, but if you're trapped in the middle of a row, just shout it out to me. Please tell me what questions you have so far. You should know, I'll spare you my little lecture. If I ask you for questions and you don't give me an A, I assume it means you've completely understood and agreed with everything I've said. Sir. I heard you except for the very few first few words. Ah. So for the recording and those who couldn't hear, how, how can you define conflict in a way that it stays away from toxicity and damage? I don't actually. I think conflict is conflict and it runs this full spectrum from incredibly damaging. I mean, who here is still really pissed off at someone that they have been pissed off at for over a year because of something that happened over a year ago in game development, right? I mean, a ton of us are. By the way, quick aside, Science of Happiness says those who forgive end up happier. Happier brains fundamentally work better. So not my topic, but if you can find your way to forgiveness, you'll be happier and work better. <laughs> Now, um, but it is the full spectrum, right? And I've had people shouting at me and I have not been at my best and I have damaged relationships when I'm down here. And I've also gone into a disagreement thinking, oh God, this is gonna suck so much and come out literally crying tears of joy because we had the most amazing breakthrough and our relationship is much better now. My job in this hour is to try to move you up that line as far as we can together. Fair enough, does that answer the question? Awesome, thank you. All right, so quick repetition, because science says repetition causes learning, repetition causes learning, repetition causes learning. So I'm telling you again, even though you smart people just heard this, to consider examining your beliefs and seeing if you can take the next step in valuing conflict. Know yourself and your style when you're not at your best and when you are at your best. Know how your team tends to respond to conflict and relate to conflict and see if you can take the next step in seeing at least the potential for value in conflict, even collaboration through conflict, so that you can show up at your best and not like, God damn it, I have to fight with this guy now. Examine your beliefs and learn to value conflict. Then. To collaborate in a difficult conversation, you have to be thinking win-win. You're gonna get there by cooperating and then asserting. If you come at conflict with a positive frame of mind, you might 
achieve one of these nicer labels, right? Aggression turns to assertion. Assertiveness is good, right? Acquiescing to somebody all the time turns into just being cooperative, right? And avoiding things means you let some stuff go. These are the more positive versions of all this, and there are upsides to all of these, right? Let's take let it go as one example. If I don't like the way you style your hair, it is literally none of my goddamn business. I should let it go and not talk to you about it in game development. So there are advantages to all these things, styles, but the science and the evidence suggest that none of these styles by themselves get you to collaboration. You don't get to collaboration if you're just awesome at asserting, nor do you get to collaboration if you're just awesome at cooperating. You get there by being awesome at both and bringing all of both. Bring all of your assertiveness and all of your cooperation, and then you're combining ideas, which is largely how creativity and innovation happen. How do you do that? Well, you got to be thinking win-win. I, I don't have time for a full story, but I'll tell you a story of a colleague who was going in to have a discussion with somebody else, and I said, I hope it goes well, and she said, it's going to go well, she just needs to apologize. <sighs> that is not a win-win mindset, and I would have bet multiple years of salary that conversation went badly. And it did. It wasn't my role to alter it or stop it. By the way, you might be thinking, dude, you're up here talking about that. Why didn't you tell her what to do? It wasn't my role to tell her what to do. But you got to be thinking win-win. So see if you can think that way before you're in the confrontation with somebody else. What's an ideal outcome for both of you? Then cooperate first. Because cooperation earns your ability to assert and earns cooperation from the other side. Some quick ideas about cooperating. Starts by seeking first to understand, then be understood. Who's read The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People? Fantastic book, decades old, but a classic with millions of copies sold because it is so useful. One of the seven habits is simply this. Seek first to understand, then to be understood. You should be able to state your opponent's position, if I can use that phrase for quick clarity, I should be able to state my opponent's position to his or her satisfaction. You should be able to say what the other person believes until they say, yep, that's it. How many of us have gone into a conversation thinking, oh boy, this is going to really suck, and then realized there was a misunderstanding and things weren't so bad? It happens all the time, but we still forget to do this, right? We go in and say, you know, when you rip me a new one in a code review, it makes it's just, it's, it's, oh, that wasn't what you were trying to do. You were trying to point out the code could be much better. I'm sorry, maybe I was a little oversensitive. So seek first to understand, tell the other person their position to their satisfaction. With feeling, show them you understand. Get them to feel that you understand. There's something known as the fast food rule actually comes from a doctor who wrote a parenting book of all things, but parenting books and, and books for managing teams and game development, surprising amount of overlap. The fast food rules comes from the fact that when you go to a fast food restaurant, you drive up to the drive-thru and you're like, I'll take a hamburger, uh, a veggie burger, and uh, some fries. And what do they do? Immediately, you want a hamburger, veggie burger, and some fries, is that right? That's what you should do in a difficult conversation as well. Somebody tells you, now, you got to be careful about this because if you exactly parrot back what somebody says the way a fast food person would, you might feel irritated and annoyed, like you're mocking me, you a-hole, right? This can go very badly very quickly. But if you paraphrase back to people and let some emotion come into it at about two-thirds of their emotional intensity, it's amazing how well this works. So if somebody comes at you and they just seem really frustrated, nine out of 10 frustrated, again, you don't want to tell people how you want to feel, but you want to show them that you get it. You sound really frustrated. I can hear how frustrated you are, and I can understand how frustrated you are. If I were dealing with a really buggy animation tool, I'd be frustrated too. You're just trying to say, I feel you. Feeling felt is a primary human need, according to psychologists. And so what many of us do, I don't want to in, 
indict a whole gender at once, but many of us want to go directly to fixing the problem. Oh, you don't need to be frustrated because I've got Julian re-architecting re animus. So you don't need to feel, skip right past the validation. That validation is cooperation and it opens the door for the other person hearing what else you have to say. When you start not with fixing the problem, but validating what you've heard and how they feel, they will relax. Oh, you get it. You get my frustration. Now I'm receptive to hearing what you have to say. So part of cooperation is reflecting back what you've heard, stating the other person's position, and showing that you feel it. You get their emotions in this con context. Be willing to change your mind. One of the favorite quotes I have learned in my multiple decades of career is this one. It's better to be effective than right. We get hung up on being right. It's better to be effective. If you're not willing to change your mind, you're not willing to collaborate, and you shouldn't be in that difficult conversation with someone. That are a, those are a few tips for cooperating. Only after you've exhibited some cooperation and after you've seen the other person's shoulders drop or brow unfurrow or jaw relax a little bit, that is your window to bring some assertion. How do I want you to assert? If you're willing and able and you want to participate, please on your feet and pose like a superhero. I'm going to ask you to hold this for two minutes. So take a pose you can hold for two minutes. You just need to take up a wide amount of physical space. Awesome power posing. Thank you. Now hand up if you've seen Amy Cuddy's TED Talk. TED is a conference, produces videos. Amy Cuddy is a Harvard professor with the number one TED Talk in the world that basically says this. You're all Harvard students now. Congratulations, I knew I had a room full of smart looking people. Now, you're all randomly divided in two. You're each asked to spit into a vial before this begins. Sorry, that's a little gross, but we need to measure a couple things in your bloodstream. Testosterone, present in women and men and associated with assertiveness, and cortisol, which is a hormone that indicates you're stressed out and reactive to stress. And then half of you are told, without any language about power or superheroes or anything else, half of you are told, would you please take a wide body posture for a couple of minutes? The other half of you, please don't do this, are told, get small fold up on yourself, maybe touch your neck, and in just two minutes your testosterone assertiveness goes down and your cortisol stress reactivity goes up and the opposite happens over here. Testosterone assertiveness comes up, cortisol stress reactivity goes down. If you want to be calm and assertive, stand like this for two minutes before you go in to have that difficult conversation. Now, science is not perfect. Science is a conversation and some studies are not finding as strongly those physical effects. But there are a number of studies here and they consistently are showing some psychological effects. We feel better when we take up more space. Amy Cuddy's further studies have actually found we are least assertive on our smartphones, see where my hands are, more assertive on our tablets, and most assertive on our PCs. <laughs> No lie, tricky, I love science, it's so awesome. So if you have to give someone some difficult feedback and you're in Chicago and they're in Florida and it's midnight and you gotta do it over email, get one of those ergonomic keyboards where you can <laughs> spread the halves out and be like, hi, Kevin, I would like to discuss this with you. By the way, it works for games. If you like strategy games like I do and enemy troops are coming at your base, put your keyboard way over here, your mouse way over here, and you're like, it's cool. I got walls, I got troops, everything's fine. It's still, ah! Okay, thank you superheroes, you can sit down. If you adopt that wide posture before or during a conflict, your body seems, your brain seems to follow what your body is doing and you stay calmer and more assertive. To begin this conversation, you wanna ask permission and then address directly, privately, and respectfully. Very quickly, let me go over those. Permission. I'm trained as an executive coach, and coaches are trained to ask lots of questions, including, may I ask you a question? I know I just did, but we're trained to say, may I ask you a question? May I provide some feedback? Is it okay if I reflect back what I'm hearing? What does that permission do? It gets buy-in from the other side. You are gonna get somewhere if you have permission. Now, this might feel silly. Well, who's gonna say no to that? Try it and see how often you get no.
I swear this has made me a better manager, a better father, a better husband. Because often I start a conversation thinking, oh, my wife really needs some, a pep talk right now. And I say, honey, can I, can, I, can I share a few thoughts with you? And she's like, not yet. I'm still processing. It's like, oh. I wouldn't have asked that a year ago, and this conversation would have gone a lot worse. Get permission before you have a difficult conversation. And if I say, hey, do you have a few minutes? I want to talk to you about the animation pipeline. And you're like, hmm, not a good time right now. Go away. Don't set yourself up for failure. Some of us run hangry. You know this word? If you're not from the US, you might say it's hungry and angry. I try to be a nice guy. If it's 440 and I'm hungry, I will be an to you. So please, if you come and say, hey, I got to talk to you, and I say, I'm low blood sugar, could you please come back later? Do yourself a favor and come back later. That's permission. Then address directly. When I do coaching and when I manage people, often I hear, Joe is such a jerk, man. Joe is so unprofessional. Joe repeatedly does these insulting things in meetings. Joe does this. Joe never does that. He's supposed to do this. He's not doing it. Me. Have you talked to Joe? No. Okay, let's go directly to the source of the problem. Now, some of us think issues through by talking with a trusted friend who's going to keep it confidential. That might be okay, but please don't be the person who talks to everybody in your studio except the person you have the issue with. Please go directly to the person you have the issue with. Then address them privately with nobody watching, if at all possible, and bring as much respect as possible. Respect is the key to getting collaboration and a difficult conversation. Challenge behaviors and ideas, not people. I know this sounds basic and easy, but most of us screw this up on a regular basis. So much so that psychology has a phrase for it, fundamental attribution error. The fundamental attribution error is, whenever we see ourselves behaving badly, we know it's because of circumstances. When we see other, people, people, when we see other people behaving badly, it's because of their character. That is, if I cut you off on I-5, it's because my wife's in the hospital and premature later, labor and I really need to get there quickly. If you cut me off on I-5, it's because you are a jerk. That's the fundamental attribution error. I invite you to stop making it by stop assuming that people's behavior is because of their character. It's almost never due to their character and almost always due to their circumstances. They're under pressure. You don't know it, but their manager has told them they're on probation because their performance isn't great. Or you don't know it, but their mom is sick with some horrible disease. I'm not trying to get all depressing on people. I'm trying to say, we all need a break. Let's give each other a break and address behavior and ideas, not people's character. If you do that, you're on a healthy pa path towards calm assertion, and you're on a path towards collaborating through cooperation, then assertion. If you have a question, please go to a mic. I'll take them in a minute. A minute of small group discussion, pairs or threes. What are you hearing? How can you use this in your jobs, please? Discuss. Thank you. Wrap up, please. Time for one question, sir. Hello? You are on. Uh, hi. Um, hi. I was just curious, how much of what you've said depends on the cultural values of the people in the conflict? What a fantastic question I know almost nothing about. Um, <laughs> it is a great question, and I apologize for my ignorance. I should have, a I mean, I asked in my first session, Please stand up if you didn't grow up speaking English, and over the half the room stood up. So that's a fantastic question, and, and really I'm embarrassed I don't have more information about cult culture here. I think uh, briefly from the ignorant standpoint, culture matters. Know the culture. If it's not your culture, it's especially important to know the culture. Lots of resources out there on cultural training and cultural so sensitivity. Just not me, sorry. Okay. Fair enough, dodge of the question, given yeah. I can't really answer it. It's a great question, though. You're, you're going to get me to go learn more about that so I can answer that better next time. Thank you for a great question. Sorry I couldn't answer it. Anyone here able to answer that question better? <laughs> Smart people in the room? No? All right. Well, ask people what their culture is, right? Certain, I know certain cultures 
thrive on disagreement much more than others. So certainly factor that in. Quick repetition for the sake of learning. To collaborate, you need to bring all of your assertion and all of your cooperation, but not in that order. Cooperate first. Define the win-win. Go in with a win-win mindset. Then cooperate first. Seek first to understand. Listen. Be willing to give or flex or change your mind. Then you're in a position to assert early, calmly, and with compelling communication. Sounds easy, and as you all know it is not easy, which is why third and final section is on boosting emotional intelligence in order to boost success. Emotional intelligence is real effectiveness. We have a very male industry. I'm guessing I'm preaching to the choir here, but sometimes our very male industry mocks the soft skills and things like emotional intelligence. Ooh. Emotional intelligence is power and effectiveness. And if you think you don't need it, you should not be leading in game development. Emotional intelligence is the ability to understand other people's emotions and your own and work effectively in that context of emotions. Quick tour of emotional intelligence. Starts by being aware of other people's emotions. I never, ever, go outside of my slides except for this moment in this workshop because I love this emotional intelligence quiz so much. This resource is in the handout. This is from Greater Good Science Center at Berkeley. They have this wonderful emotional intelligence quiz. I am just going to whet your appetite with it. This woman is one, embarrassed, two, afraid, three, sad, or four, surprised. I don't want you to influence each other, so I'm gonna say one, two, three, throw, and then I want you to put up a number of fingers. If you think she's embarrassed, show me one finger. If you show me one finger, I'd appreciate it if it's this one. Up uh, two, fear, three, sadness, four, surprise. Anyone not clear what I'm asking you to do? One, two, three, throw. Show me fingers. Now first, look around the room. Many of you are wrong because you don't have the, right, the same number up, right? Uh, Non-scientific survey says, oh, it's kind of a toss up between one and two. I will go with one. She's embarrassed. Wrong if you showed one. Not trying to make you feel bad, but trying to get you to recognize how difficult it is to recognize emotions. Part of what I love about this quiz is it doesn't just tell you you're wrong, but exactly how you're wrong and how you could be right next time. So they tell you that she has a fearful face and they show you what happens when somebody is afraid in their face. Let's do at least one more because it's just fun. This guy is one, flirting with you. Two, interested. Three, happy. Four, polite. One finger for flirting, two for interested, three for happy, four for polite. One, two, three, show please. Lots of fours, some threes. I may have primed you by being the chief happiness officer of happy brain science. Oh, you said four, polite, sorry, three. I thought I primed you for the right answer, I guess I didn't. Uh, the difference between politeness and happiness is whether the eyes are smiling and his eyes are smiling, so he is really happy. Uh, fun, right? You'd like to do all of them, right? Great, that's an exercise for you after this workshop. Uh, by the way, if you get good at that one, I encourage you to find, uh, you, there's a pointer to it from the handout if you want the handout. New York Times has emotional intelligence quiz where you get this much of the face. It is awesome. You can understand a lot of somebody's emotional state just by seeing their eyes. If you are ever in a difficult conversation, make lots of eye contact. Depends on your culture, of course, how much eye contact is appropriate. And if you overdo eye contact, it can feel threatening. So please be human and normal about it. But if you're not sometimes making eye contact, you're missing an opportunity to understand how the other person is feeling. That's emotional intelligence of other people's emotions. And the next step is to be more aware of your own emotions. And as psychologists say, name it to tame it. Why do they say name it to tame it? Because the part of your brain that has access to language and can label your emotions is different than that limbic system that's, that's in the driver's seat when you're feeling emotions. So just saying, what's the word for this? shifts 
some of your brain activity to a calmer, more logical, more uniquely human part of the brain. More glucose, oxygen, et cetera, go to your prefrontal cortex and other more logical parts of your brain when you think, what is this that I'm feeling? Feelings are really feelings in your body. If you practice what is called a body scan meditation, you get better at recognizing your own emotions. Hands up, please, if you have ever meditated in your life. According to surveys, it's about half of us. Looks like more than that here. Coincidence that you all who ended up as leaders practice meditation? I think not. Science suggests not. Not here to talk about mindfulness, but growing mountain of evidence says it does awesome things for us, including boosts self-awareness, self-control, quality of relationships, and happiness. So if you choose to practice mindfulness, you'll get better at those things and probably be a better leader. So body scan meditation, all you're doing is focusing your attention on how one part of your body at a time feels. For emotional intelligence, you're typically working with this part of the body, right? Is my forehead all furrowed up or not? Am I clenching my teeth or not? Are my shoulders up or not? Does my chest feel tight or not? Is there a pit in my stomach or not? Practice makes progress at more quickly recognizing and more accurately labeling those feelings in your body, those emotions that you have. Then when you go to label that emotion, what many of us do is we go with the big three. The big three are I'm mad, I'm sad, I'm afraid. Those are the big three because they're very common, but part of emotional intelligence is boosting your ability to accurately label your emotions. And there are hundreds of different words that describe emotion in addition to mad, sad, and afraid. Let's see how many of them we can get in about 15 seconds. Don't raise your hands, just shout out any emotion, any word that describes a human emotion. Disgust, Disgust and frustration, frustration and terror, terror and Embarrassment, I'm gonna say. I heard eight words at once, so I made up my own. What else? Good, I'm glad you're saying words. I can't hear them. I play a lot of drums and trumpet. What else? Yeah, awesome, good. I'm sure you were saying smart things. Sorry, I couldn't hear you better. Keep practicing with that, right? If, if you're actually humiliated, don't say mad. Might be a mix of anger with the humiliation, but see if you can refine your vocabulary. And then again, try this with other people too, but don't tell them how they're feeling. Nobody wants to be told how they're feeling, right? It's not, you're clearly embarrassed, right? It's not that, it's, I'm getting the sense that maybe you've got some embarrassment around what I did, is that accurate? Test your assumptions on people, let them tell you how they're feeling. More to the point on this slide, be self-aware and name it to tame it. When you know what your discussion partner's emotional state is and your emotional state is, it is then your job to use emotional intelligence to help yourself and others feel safe in conflict. You all know Google down the road does lots and lots of data gathering about what makes teams work and not work. And the, the reading that I've done recently suggests that of, of the many factors that Google has found, they believe that psychological safety is at the top of the list. Anyone here from Google by chance? Just want to give you the chance to correct me if I've got this wrong, but I believe that Google's data is suggesting psychological safety leads to thriving teams more than any other factor they've found. What does that mean? It means you can be yourself, bring your emotions, bring your ideas, bring your thoughts, and you're not gonna be treated meanly, right? You're gonna be treated with respect. Doesn't mean everyone's gonna love your idea, but they're gonna treat you in a respectful way. You need to keep yourself and your discussion partner feeling safe at all times if you're in disagreement. And if either one of you is moving towards fight or flight, it is immediately stop, time out, both get back to psychological safety, or you cannot be constructive. Right, if I go to give you your performance review and I start off with, well, your performance has been horrible, and you go, and blood starts 
jumping all over your face and you're sweating. And I go, let me explain the reasons that we are giving you. It's like, no, you're not gonna hear me anymore, right? I have to get you back to some sort of psychological safety before you can hear me. We might even need to call a timeout and say, you know what? I'm tired, I'm hungry, I can't do this right now. I know we need to work this through. Let's pick up tomorrow at 10.30, is that cool? You, even if you need to take a time out, you need to take that time out because it's only when you and your discussion partner or partners are feeling psychologically safe that you can be constructive about it and not just damaging about it. So be aware of emotions, use that information to keep yourself and others feeling safe in conflict. One way to keep the other person feeling safer is to move past blame. Might sound obvious, but again, you're wired to blame because it's a defense mechanism and we're wired to defend ourselves against threats, right? It's not my fault. It's the stupid coding standards that made that code end up ugly, right? Or it's Julie's fault or Jose's fault. When you're pointing the blame at somebody else, you are giving away all of your power. Right? If it's all Mike's fault, then there's nothing you can do about it. So you just made yourself powerless. Not a very emotionally intelligent thing to do. There's a guy out there named Christopher Avery who has a program called The Leadership Gift that's all about moving from blame and other defensive stages towards true responsibility. Highly recommend it if you want to check it out. For the moment, you just want to keep in mind part of being emotional and emotionally intelligent is not making the foolish state mistake of just casting blame everywhere else. It's almost always a system. It's no one particular person's fault. It's the circumstances you're in. It's the deadline you're under. It's the fact that the engine is buggy. There's other factors at play here. Move past blame so that you can get to real responsibility. That is boosting emotional intelligence to boost success. Again, a quick minute or two of conversation and then questions at the mics. But let's first start with 30 seconds of testing yourself. Why? Because testing causes learning. It signals your brain that information's gonna get used, therefore should be retained. So question is, what have you heard and how can you apply it? First, 30 seconds of silence, please. Thank you so much. Now, I would encourage you to find a new discussion partner. Why? Because I can't do it here, but every time I pass out feedback forms and ask for suggestions for improvement, lots of people always write, if I don't suggest new partners, lots of people write, should I have us pick a new partner? So I'm gonna recommend that you pick a new partner. I'm also gonna recommend that you get up and walk around while you do this, but what you do is up to you, of course. Discuss for the next couple of minutes in pairs or small groups. What have you heard? How can you apply this? Please wrap up those conversations. And I would love it if you had a question or a comment at the mics. Starting right there, please, sir. So something you said that, that stood out for me a lot was that you should try to match their um, intensity at like a two thirds. Yep. And something, and this is more outside of work, but just uh, like sometimes with somebody, uh, th they, they'll be angry and I'll be calm and I take kind of pride in staying in a very calm state, but they'll be mad at me for being calm. Uh -huh, and exactly. not getting angry Exactly, so yep. how, do you, what, how do you find that, I mean, the, the two thirds thing's interesting, but if you could speak to that. Yeah, it, essentially it boils down to this. A, a bunch of communication at the emotional level is nonverbal. Right? In fact, there are studies that suggest we can understand each other's emotional state better through sounds than words. So let's just try it as an experiment. I'm gonna say one, two, three, and then I want you to make a sound that just represents how you're feeling. Might be tired, might be psyched, might be whatever. Uh, if you're willing, here comes. I'm gonna say one, two, three, just make a noise. Ready? One, two, three. Ah. You're psyched, I'm tired. All right, good. Uh, <laughs> So anyway, a bunch of emotional communication is at a nonverbal level, right? So if somebody comes at you nine out of 10 angry, 
and you stay zero out of 10 angry. I can see how upset you are. They might think, well, this is, they might logically think it's good he's staying calm, but it emotionally is like, God damn it, you don't get it. This is a really big problem. I understand it's a really big problem. I want you to stay calm. Emotionally, they know you get it when you say, now you don't have to be angry, right? But you want to feed a representation of their emotion back to them in an emotional way. So instead of saying, you know, God damn it, this sucks so much, that's them. And you say, I can see that you are really upset. I'm not doing that. I didn't do anything. I don't. <sighs> I cringed when you cringed, we feel emotionally synchronous now, right? <laughs> so if they come at you nine out of 10, like, God damn it, this is so bad, and, I'm like, and you stay calm, but you say, ooh, I can really hear that you are upset. See if you don't see their shoulders drop. Uh, we need to feel felt, right? We need to know that our message got through. Here, here's another analogy, if you will. Imagine going to your executive producer and saying, Hey, dude, I think the animation and audio systems are really badly passaging, massing messages to each other. There's lots of bugs coming out in there. And they're like, get out. They don't respond at all. What do you do? Like, dude, I don't think you've heard me. Like, there's a real problem in how the messages are getting back. You speak up until you've been heard, right? That's what they want to hear is that you get it. And emotionally getting it may be more important in a difficult conversation than a logical one. Does that make sense? Thanks for a great question. Over here, please. It, are, there, uh, are there situations where, unfortunately, the, the best ultimate resolution is to, is to no longer work together? Yes. And, and how do you get to that resolution in, in the least <laughs> painful way? Did you see me try to dodge the rest of that question? How do you get to that resolution in the least painful way? Um, so, so first of all, I, I, what, you're, what you're getting at in a way is don't you need somebody cooperative on the other side? And heck yeah, you do. Uh, one of my favorite jokes, how many psychologists does it take to change a light bulb? One, but the light bulb has to want to change. <laughs> how many discussion partners does it take to collaborate through candid conversation? One, but they have to want to work it through with you. And if they just don't want to talk to you, you will not succeed at anything I have shared with you today. Sorry. We're still dealing with human beings. Human beings are hard. Uh, it is often the right solution to just end the relationship. I, I, I say often because I think most of us hold on to people too long. Hands up if you should have fired somebody sooner than you did. Hands up if you fired somebody too soon. Okay, we have two hands compared to like 50, right? Because we tend to hold on to people too long. I'm almost out of time, so I can't tell you a great story, but maybe afterwards I have a fantastic story about trying not to fire someone out of taking care of them. And when we finally fired him, he vaulted to an awesome job at a different game company. It was just a bad fit. I want to take more questions, but I should not. I so apologize, because you've been in line for a while. I will be right here. I've got cards down here and a couple cards back by the camera. I'm happy to take the question over email or right afterwards. Sorry. Thank you for understanding. Quick repetition. Boost emotional intelligence to boost success means recognizing emotions in others and yourself too, moving past blame, communicating, in a way that keeps both people feeling safe and respected even when you disagree. Intelligently conduct candid conversations in order to collaborate. How will you apply what you have learned? If you don't apply this, this hour has largely been a waste of your time. So I hope you will think about this, get very specific in your answers. The handout has a place for you to get very specific. Say when and where you're gonna handle it, and you're gonna follow through, and you're more likely to follow through. Quick summary, and we will wrap up. Difficult conversations make your hard work harder. These difficult conversations are often where the part project gets back on track or really goes off the rails. So I want you to draw on data and experience to, to better handle these difficult conversations and reach collaboration. All recommended reading, recommended reading starts here, continues in the handout, full recommended reading list on my site, happybrainscience.com. What does all that data and experience tell us? It is possible to intelligently conduct candid conversations in order to reach true collaboration even through difficulty. 
easier said than done. So examine your beliefs, see if you can keep learning to see the value in conflict so that you can be a bit better state for that conflict. Then to reach collaboration, bring all of your cooperation, then all of your assertion to reach collaboration and breakthrough ideas. Continue to boost your emotional intelligence in order to boost success. And here again is how to get the handout if you'd like a lot more detail. Thank you so much for your time and attention.